So honored to be joined by one of the nicest people in pro wrestling for over 50 years. This man has documented. Wait a minute, shut up. Don't say that. In a variety of ways. He's best remembered by many from his work in wrestling magazines. It's Bill Apter. Bill, welcome to the Ring Pro Wrestling well, Conversation. Thank you. It is great. You know what's funny that your um the name of the show, which I love it, is under the ring because people always ask me during my prime days with the magazines, when you die, what's the ideal situation? I said, I'm going to be shooting pictures at the ring. There's going to be a riot. I'm going to go under the ring and it's going to collapse on me. <laughs> So very, very apropos uh, um, name of the show to bring me on to. And it's very great nice. to see you. Great um, to see you. Well, How have you been? What, what, have, what have you been up to? Oh, my God. I, I mean, I do. Uh, I juggle two careers every day. Let me just uh, adjust my lighting here. Um, so during the day, um, I'm a job coach. I help people with disabilities to find real jobs, not, hey, you've got a disability, go to a fast food place and wipe tables. But And if that's what they want to do, that's great. Uh, and as soon as I uh, get home and at times during the day, I change into my off out of my Clark Kent costume and I go to work for uh, Sports Kita. I've been with Sports Kita Wrestling for about a year and a half right now. Um, and if you go to their video channel wrestle binge just the way it sounds wrestle binge you can see my videos several times a week as a matter of fact and i still have the uh one wrestling video uh station as well billaptor.com but as a matter of fact i did an interview with sergeant slaughter um part one ran last week and within three hours we had close to a hundred thousand views which i was shocked at ease, Strom. That's great. Um, going back in your career, being involved with Stanley Weston and his magazines for many years, what was it like being inside of a world that so few people had access to? Oh, wrestling my, it wrestling is so different than it is today. It is. It was. It was great because he had his office in his house, and uh, the editorial offices were uh, near the bedrooms and the art department was on the other side of his home. Um, he would, well, I was uh, in his uh, office in his basement. He had all the photo files and I was the guy responsible for developing pictures and taking the photographer packages that were getting sent by the various freelancers and filing them but he always told me he said no matter what no matter what you hear in this place anything about wrestling you don't repeat it anywhere and that was the first real um indoctrination into the wrestling business keeping kayfabe at the magazines yeah how important was stanley to pro wrestling that was really a dream team that you guys had at oh, least when, I, when I was reading it when i was he was up. long he was long before me he's the guy who created um the first wrestling magazine i ever bought in 1959 maybe was on sale at sunnyside garden and it was 50 cents and it was wrestling review and his other publication was boxing illustrated wrestling news uh, the wrestlers loved being in his magazine. He was very important because they knew um, he was kind of the original version of me in some ways. <laughs> uh, they knew, you know, they could get their pictures published, etc. And uh, they did everything they could to uh, to help him. And he had a lot of close friends that uh, kind of passed the word around that he was good, like Al Costello from the uh, Fabulous Kangaroos. Uh, Ricky Starr, they were very close friends of his, and uh, yeah, they put the word out there, and uh, yeah, actually, he started his business on a green kitchen table in their kitchen. Uh, wow. That's where he wrote the first issue of Wrestling Review. He got, un unfortunately, when he started coming out with the early issues of The Wrestler and Inside Wrestling, he got a lot of wrestlers angry at him. Uh, which hurt me at the beginning of my career. He uh, ran a story of This Is Your Life on uh, that guy over here, Bruno Sammartino. We had Bruno's um, 
sister at like five years old killing a Nazi in, uh, in Italy. And Mil Mascaris was upset. I, when I met him, he said, who wrote that story? He says, uh, um, uh, my family is not grow up in an adobe hut. They, uh, they were dentists, doctors, professionals. So, and Andre the Giant was furious at one of them because it said that uh, uh, Edouard Carpentier uh, was his hero and that wasn't true. So I had to go in and one of the first people that I met, I was doing a radio show in New York. Uh, I bought my own time. And one of the first, I got press tickets and I went to Sunnyside Garden in Queens on Queens Boulevard and I met Gorilla Monsoon. And he said, who do you work for? I said, Stanley West. And he said, well, you're not welcome here. Whoa. I said, what happened? He said, you know what? The San Martinos and I are very close family. He sent a photographer to my house to do an at home with Gorilla Monsoon story. And I showed him my gun collection and I held one gun up like this. And the headline came out, uh, I might do this to Monsoon. And oh my goodness. So Monsoon said that he'd give me a a chance, you know, to see if I could do any better. And I, I got to meet Bruno and um, I said, you know what, I'm working for him and I will straighten this out. And I did the very first shoot interview with uh, Bruno wow. in any magazine. Um, Bruno was very upset because he said, like, this is your life story, embarrassed he and his family because none of it uh, was, was true. So, uh, yeah, so after a while, uh, I got to meet Vince Sr. And he also said, well, if you're working for Stanley, you're not too popular here, but we'll give you a chance. And that put the key in the ignition. They all wanted to be on my, uh, let me see if I can find this, on my old radio show that was on uh, WHBI 105.9 FM in New York. I bought my own time. And, uh, well, I have a whole series of uh, uh, audio cassettes back from when I started um, in the mid-60s doing that radio show. And uh, I still have most of those interviews, and I run them on uh, my YouTube channels periodically. So, yeah, that, that's that's how it happened. And then word started getting around, hey, that after's okay. And here I am uh, 51 years later. Yeah. It's interesting, like, you know, like you mentioned with your publications being uh... – well, remember, they weren't my publications. Everybody, right, the publications means, you work. They're with. the after yeah. mags. Dave Meltzer came. I never up called with them that. the after mags. <laughs> no, no, but Dave Meltzer came up with that terminology, yeah. and it's driven me crazy. I'm flattered. It's endearing, you know. That. But <laughs> I'm, like you, working in newspapers, we had an entire editorial department, and I was one of the people in the editorial department. But the promoters started to say, "Hey, this guy can talk. Uh, he dresses nicely when he comes to our shows. Let's put him on TV." So the next chapter. I remember when I when I met you was actually at the WrestleMania 30 press conference at the Hard Rock Cafe in uh, Midtown Manhattan, and I told you I that your your magazines were basically the first things I'd ever read. And you looked at me and told me, "Well, you probably looked at a lot of my pictures too." Yeah, I think it's I think it's hard for people to understand now that you can't just look up easily back then, you know, what happened in the companies that you didn't follow. Like I remember when I was a kid, if I wanted to know what the uh, Rip Oliver was doing in Portland, I had to buy Pro Wrestling Illustrated. I, yes. You know, what, what was it like to be the key to publicity for so many people? Oh, I loved it because uh, um, every week, every Monday, I called every wrestling office. I'd call uh, Vince McMahon Sr. at home. And uh, his wife, Juanita, would always answer the phone and go, oh, Vincent, it's that nice young man from New York, Bill. <laughs> and uh, then I'd call Jim Crockett, and he'd always say, hey, what's the scuttlebutt going on here? Don Owen in Portland would go like, I don't want to talk about them. I don't need my magazine. And hang up. He was very uh, – uh, Gary Hart and I would talk every Monday. He was Fritz von Erich's booker. Um, Florida, I talked to uh, Gordon Soley. Generally, and oh, you know, I, I absolutely adored him, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, so it was great because they they were expecting my calls. The one call every Monday, though, that I looked forward to, but I needed to spend time was Jim Ross mm -hmm. when he was working for Bill Watts. I would just say, "What's all I had to say was what's going on," and he'd go without a break for forty five minutes while I was trying <laughs> to write it down. Imagine that. Maybe Jim I got two lines from in the, in the column from that. 
Jim it's Ross could talk. Funny. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one Good thing, old you know, Jr. He, he is uh, he's great to deal with, though. I, I you know, I've sure is, sure is. He's he is one of the real legends of the business. He and I started close to the same time. Yeah. Um, and I respect that he's still around. One thing when I've dealt with wrestlers, my background, as you said, is journalism. So I try to treat everyone fairly and in a journalistic way. Mm -hmm. But watching the way that you deal with wrestlers, and I told you this before, is something that I aspire to. You treat them all with respect and you don't poke fun or make light of anything that they're doing. No. How hard was it for you to gain trust within the wrestling community? It was very difficult at the beginning until that Bruno story that I did the shoot interview with him uh and he'd spread the word around then uh mr weston would call various promoters that he was close with and said you know this guy is smart to the business that's what his voice was like um but that didn't matter really uh i had to make sure that i listened when i needed to listen i never asked if titles are going to change i was a, like a sports illustrated reporter and photographer going after a story wrestling for us in the magazines was totally done as it, everything was real and that's what we based it on even though we came up with uh, uh incredibly unusual stories back then we always stayed within the angles and sometimes the wrestlers um would call us and say, hey, that angle you did with us, we did we weren't doing that, but we're gonna do that now. So uh yeah, it was it was very uh easy after a few years to gain the trust of uh of the wrestlers and a lot of the promoters too. What as you look at wrestling journalism well, Phil, actually what I want to yeah, add to that is it depends how you present yourself. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of the people on the internet right now, they'll go to a story and they'll to a match and they'll have a press conference and they're asking all these, well, you know, uh, why did the uh, so-and-so do this? And he sucked in the ring. We never did anything like that. It was, they were an athlete and we were covering the story. That's what, and they knew that that's, that's what I was. And a lot of them knew that I, I, I personally could give them publicity because I was the guy out there and I'd go back to the editors in the office and say, we got to do something like this. This is big. Yeah, and it's interesting for, from my perspective is I've never wanted to be the guy to like review the shows and break down every single move that's happening. My yeah. idea for this show was pro wrestlers are some of the most interesting people I've ever talked to. Mm -hmm. And if I can have nice, good, long conversation, longish, kind of short because it's half hour, mm -hmm. but conversations with them, you know, all the better. It's it, it's just I think people will find things interesting hearing from them sure uh, more than, absolutely more than hearing from me necessarily but a lot of them in the current day and age reveal things and everybody knows that it's you know uh, this is an uh, it's it's a uh, stunt men doing a great thing in the ring and entertaining and the finish is uh, predetermined and i don't you know i i don't really like that kayfabe has completely you know, just completely been broken at this point. First time I ever heard the word. First time. I was in Philadelphia and I walked into a dressing room and Phil Zacco, the promoter, had some issues with Mr. Weston. And he said, who do you work for? I said, Stanley Weston. He said, get the hell out of here. And I hear all the wrestlers going, cafe, cafe. No idea what it was. <laughs> so then a few years later, I was in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and I walked into a... Uh, into a dressing room and Tommy Young, the referee was in there with Blackjack Mulligan and a few other guys and Mulligan I, or somebody yelled out K Fave. And Tommy says, K Fave him. He's been doing this longer than any of you. <laughs> yeah. But I never understood that it was a, a word that came out from the carnival circuit right. when they didn't want someone to know something they are to hide something, they'd say kayfabe. And Gorilla Monsoon's license plate, by the way, on his car. I heard that, yeah. Kayfabe, yeah. Yeah. You talked about it a little bit, and this was kind of the next question that I had uh, on my notes, too. But what what is important? What do you see that's important about wrestling journalism as you as so many more people have a voice, like in the, in the current 2023 
Oh, landscape. what I see is people just ripping things all the time. So much of the internet wrestling community is nothing but complaining. It's um, negative. Yeah. Yeah. But I look at a guy like Mike Johnson at Great PW guy. Insider. And to me, he is what the current internet crop should be. I don't like revealing a lot of things, but I find when I'm doing my interviews for Sports Kita or the the after chat uh, that a lot of the wrestlers, even though I'm staying in their character, they're breaking kayfabe now too. Right? You know, they're making like everybody knows. But I love the internet community. They've been great to me, really, really great to me. But I just think there's too much negativity. Yeah, and I think you can find the line there of being critical and not just being overly negative. You can be critical without being. Oh, well, you know, so his match really sucked. You know, I hated it. Don't watch him again. Why would you do that? Hey, so and so's match wasn't up to par tonight. It surprised me a little bit, but maybe next time he'll uh, he or she will give a better performance. Yeah, it, it's it's definitely. Uh, it's it's kind of a fan culture you see in a lot of different uh, genres nowadays too. From what yeah, uh, but you, you know what changed that in wrestling? What's that? Three letters ECW. Hmm. That fan became a whole new kind. We've never seen the fan that would yell out "You effed up" mm-hmm. or stuff like that before ECW. I'm not blaming them, but it changed the fan completely. A lot of uh, today's fans, WWE fans, are not that group of fans but aew fans i find a lot of them are those kind of fans when i was watching uh uh, dynamite the other night um it was amazing that uh all the fans were yelling you effed up at one of the spots here and i warner brothers discovery might have been going like and even the language i found out through sergeant slaughter in the recent interview i did with him that he said the reason vince started scripting stuff is back in the days like when CM Punk would come out and curse on on TV. Vince didn't want any of that. He thought it would be very bad for the sponsors. So that's why he started integrating more script script rather into this thing. I never knew that before, but that's what the Sarge told me. And I, I you, you can control that. the situation better when you know what's going to exactly. be said. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be word for word. But mm-hmm. uh, it, it should be classy. If you go back and watch some of those old Madison Square Garden shows, and I'm, I'm that, that's probably the history that I'm most fascinated by is New York, probably because I, I was there. York. You were ringside, sometimes George Napolitano, sometimes yeah. Paul Heyman, too. What was it? What was a day like? And what was it like being there for all those big moments? And, and even some of the mundane ones, probably. In, oh, what, in what was, was the, the day Mecca like? Of Pro I Wrestling. would leave the office in Rockville Center. Uh, Long Island, New York, get on the train about 1.30, 2 o'clock, get to Manhattan around 2.15, 2.30. Uh, I would go to the Holland Hotel on 42nd Street between 8th and 9th Avenue, and I'd walk up three floor elevator or walk up to the third floor where Capital Wrestling had a little office with Arnold Skolan, Gorilla Monsoon, Angelo Savoldi, and a bunch of other guys all smoking and playing poker. And Arnie would give us uh, our press ticket. It was just a walk-in ticket. So after that, a few of us would meet and have uh, dinner at Angelo's restaurant across the street from the Holland Hotel. And then about 6.15, go to the garden and to the employee's entrance up to the sixth floor in the elevator. And bingo, that's where all the wrestlers were hanging out in the hallway. And we'd, I'd do my interviews. And, uh, and George was there all the time, too, by the way. Yeah, and uh, I'll do my interviews, shoot pictures, uh, schmooze with the with uh, with Vince Senior, Vince Junior when he started coming around. So it was great. It was a it was being special backstage and making them feel special that the magazine was interested in them, and me feeling special that they kind of were taking a liking to me because I was a fan since I was. 12 years old do you remember what your first msg show as a uh, as a ringside photographer was and i don't was- i don't i do know it was uh <clears throat> it was bruno in the main event 
but I don't remember. It's probably 1971 or the end, actually the, the end of 70, a few weeks, a month or two before Bruno lost the title to Koloff. Nice. As uh, moving on, uh, as you saw the Andy Kaufman, Jerry Lawler saga play out, how did, how did you feel it. about that and, and, and your and your role in that, if people don't know about it? Well, that. my role in it is like, and I use this a lot, but I put the key in the ignition. Andy had come to the garden a lot backstage. And I remember saying to Vince Sr. one time, you know, the guy wants to wrestle. He said, no, no, he's a good, nice, nice kid, but we, we don't want to look bad. We don't want to. And Vince Jr. had him on at ringside a couple of times on some interviews. So Andy knew me from the magazine. He said, what are you doing after the matches? I said, well, I'm going home to my apartment in Queens. He said, where do you live? I said, Queens in Kew Gardens. He said, how do you get there? I said, uh, Subway. Now, here's the guy who's starring on Taxi. He's starring <laughs> on Taxi. The number one hit comedy show. And he's on the subway with me going back there. At that time, I was rooming with Susan Sexton, the Australian girl wrestler. And I walked in and to the apartment. Everything she said was with the F-bomb. She said, oh, hi, Bill. Oh, hi, F and Andy Kaufman. And it's like, so after about three hours of us chatting, she says, is that all you can talk about to him, wrestling? He says, yeah, I want to be Fred Blassie or um, Nature Boy Buddy Rogers. So she went in the bedroom, put on her headphones, put on the Blast of the Ramones, Gabba Gabba Hey, and that was the last we saw of her. So I said, Vince McMahon isn't interested, but I have a friend in Memphis. He says, oh, I've seen those things in the magazine. I said, they, they have characters like uh, the Wolfman and Frankenstein. And they're, they're, they're way ahead of the level where they do like almost entertainment. I said, why don't we call Jerry Lawler? And he said, well, it's one o'clock in the morning. I said, it's midnight there. We're wrestling people. We're up all night. <laughs> so I called Kaufman. He says, you got Andy Kaufman, the guy from taxi in your roach infested apartment? I said, yeah. I put Andy on and that was the start of the whole thing. And as that as that kind of progressed, like did that kind of just blow your mind to see how big that it got? Oh my god! Like, when they did the Letterman show, yeah, it was totally amazing. Now, Mister Weston was a lot like Vince Senior. He didn't want entertainment in the magazines. So the day after that, Lawler was coming out to the office on Long Island. I said to Mister Weston, "I'd like to send a car to get him. Let him take the railroad." And here he was, like the guy that a zillion people saw on TV. <laughs> taking the Long Island Railroad and signing autographs. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Um, so you've known the current Vince McMahon for over 50 years. Junior, yes, forever. And obviously you knew his father. What What's your relationship been like with him over the years, and what's it like now? Well, it was, it was horrible for a long time. And he told me never to take it personally. Interesting. He started his own magazine. He offered me the job. Uh, as an editor on the magazine, I turned him down because I said I'm loyal to uh, Stanley Weston. And after a while, I was told by our magazine distributors that uh, uh, Vince's people were calling them, telling them not to take our magazines anymore. He's going to block access mm. to uh, to all. And he did that. And anytime he'd see me at an arena, which was rare because we usually sent a photographer to shoot from the stands because I didn't want to embarrass me and mm -hmm. I didn't want to embarrass him. Um, so there was very, very little contact there. Um, I met Linda McMahon at one point at, um, at a WrestleMania affair. And she said, said uh, you know, uh, when I went to wow magazine, she says, when a, you're always family to us, but we can't help you at all. But eventually when their business started going down, I jumped ahead there. When business started going around, around the uh, Nation of Domination time, um, I got a call that they needed some photos for something. And I said, well, I can't do it unless I can get access. And that opened it up for me, only me, to start with. And then little by little, they started letting George back in. And then now, you know, nowadays, nowadays, uh, they know that I don't going with a camera or recording device. Um, nowadays, I go backstage and see the family. <clears throat> and because it's family to me, I've been doing this for 51 years. Um, and it's cool to me 
that a lot of the young wrestlers know who I am. Oh, we used to buy, no matter what I do, it's like the singer that does a three hour concert, but they only want to hear that one hit song. It's the same thing with me and PWI. No matter what I do, all the TV shows I was on, the Crockett TBS shows, Joe Pedicino's Pro Wrestling this week, they, and the conventions when I'm doing book signings, what do they talk about? PWI. Yeah. I mean, it was an unbelievable. I, I don't think the modern fan, if they were not born after a certain date, can understand how important it was to get that every month and all the all oh, the different yeah. personalities of all the different columnists in there, whether they yes, were yeah. whether they were real or fictional too. But well, the the thing that irks me is people think that Dan Shockett and Eddie Elner were not real. Dan died yep. at an early age. He had cancer. And Eddie, if you go into onto Facebook, uh, Eddie has a business called Yoga Soup. Yeah, I've and, seen that. Uh, yeah, Brandy Menkevich exists. I just saw her Sunday at a party that Craig Peters threw for his uh, lady friend. And I had seen Brandy in about 15 years, and she still looks fabulous. Um, Stu Sachs still lives in my neighborhood. So, yeah. So we're going to move on to something we call the three count now. It's going to be three quick oh questions and your answers. I so love it. First one is you always ask wrestlers who their toughest opponent was. Who was your toughest interview or your toughest photograph? Toughest interview was one that never happened. It was Vince Jr. I tried a hundred times to get him to interview and it never happened. So that that was tough and I'm still pursuing it. I would love to hear that. I think that I would you, too. You're, you're the perfect person to be able to interview him and cover what you need to. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Well, unquestionably, Mr. McMahon, what? Uh, yeah. So we'll, we'll put that out there. So uh, second question, we've uh, we've gone to karaoke before. What is Man, your go to karaoke song? It changes every, you know, back here um, is my karaoke machine. Um, it changes all the time. Um, uh, yesterday it was uh, uh, Tom Jones. Uh, I've been in love so many times, thought I knew the score, but girl, you treated me so bad, I can't take any more. And it looks like I'm never gonna fall in love again. So that that was last night's. Very good, very good. I I I had a great time. The two times that we did it. In, oh, uh, I enjoyed in myself were with you. Fantastic, so, so fun. Yeah. Um, I haven't gotten to do it too much lately. Only like once or twice in the last couple. A of lot years. of places closed because they did. of the, uh, COVID. Yeah, yeah. But I'm down here every night. I have about a hundred karaoke discs. I do um, uh, Andy Williams stuff. If I don't know the words, I don't sing it. By the way. Yeah, um, that's tough to pick up something you don't really know that well. No, I won't do that. Barry Manilow stuff, Andy Williams, Steve Lawrence, uh, Tracy Lawrence, the country singer, Toby Keith, nice. um, uh, Engelbert Humperdinck, just one song of his, um, Taylor Swift. One day you'll be living in a big old city and all you're ever going to be is me. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Bill, Bill Apter is a Swifty, folks. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. I'm a and fan of Lowe, though. Manilow's my... Uh, I like We that. just went to see him at Radio City a few weeks How ago. How was that? And it was fabulous. He's still... His voice is so good. And he sang all his hits except my favorite one, Somewhere Down the Road. He missed that one. My favorite Manilow song. That's great. And then last question. You get to start a promotion and you get to pick five wrestlers from any era. Who do you choose? Oh, my God. Well, if I want to draw money, it would be Bruno, mm -hmm. Flair, um, The Undertaker. Um, I need that. Uh, uh, Avon Eric. And um, I'm trying to John Cena. Yeah. That takes in all the errors. A any particular uh, member of the Von Erics? Kerry. Carrie, okay. And no, and I no, still talk to Kevin. Very, very good. And, and no Mil Mascaris there? Oh, actually, I, yes, Mil Mascaris for sure. So let's remove one of the... There's no rules, really, so we could just okay, add Mil. Yeah. <laughs> Real name is uh, Mel Moskowitz. Um, I have the mask that's laying down here that he debuted at Madison Square Garden. You can't see it because it's laying down. But 
Yeah, I still talk to him. He was the reason people always say he didn't want to do the job. Hulk Hogan, same thing. He's protecting the character. Yeah. And Mil Mascaris, to me, back in the 70s, watching him, it was, it was what his matches were like a ballet. He was so smooth, you know, put him in a hold and he go. And there were a lot of guys like Angelo King, King, King Kong Mosca, rest his soul, that wouldn't work. They worked with him, but anytime he'd do that flying press, they'd move right out of the way. And yeah. he could move like that with a with a pretty big physique too. He had a huge for, physique, yes. Yeah, he had a huge yeah. upper body. So, yeah. uh, Bill, thank you so much for joining me today on Under the Ring Pro Wrestling Conversations. Everybody, check out his stuff on Sports Kita and on the YouTube channel he mentioned earlier. Yes, Wrestle Binge. Wrestle Binge. Uh, right, and oh, you can follow me uh, uh, right here at uh, After One Wrestling on Twitter. Very nice. And don't uh, forget about my book. Is wrestling fixed? I didn't know it was broken. It's still on sale on Amazon. And uh, it's a story of my uh, career up to the past seven years. And I'm not slowing down whatsoever, brother. All right, Bill. Thanks so much for joining me. Really enjoyed this. Thank you, Phil. I enjoyed it, too.